Hey guys, welcome back. It's me, Gimpy. I'm here with a uh, little bit different style game for you today. This is the Doolittle Raid Enemy Coast Ahead by GMT Games. And I gotta say, this is one hell of a game. I have loved it from the moment I saw it. Uh, I had actually watched a couple of videos and some reviews about it, and I was like, okay, I gotta go out and get this, because this seems like something will be right up my alley. This game simulates the Doolittle Raid, which if you don't know, the short history of it is uh, a few months after uh, Pearl Harbor happened, when the Japanese attacked uh, Hawaii, uh, America needed a morale boost. We needed to perk up American spirits, <clears throat> not to mention show the Japanese that we could get them back at their homeland. We could hit them where they live as well. So Lieutenant Colonel Do uh, Doolittle, by the name, uh, planned a raid to launch B-25 bombers off an aircraft carrier which to that date hadn't been done and to do so they had to sail the aircraft car aircraft carriers actually there were a couple of them uh, close to Japan because we had no bases we could fly these planes off of and they needed to get close enough that not only could the bombers bomb Japan but they could actually get to China Russia somewhere where they had a landing site and land safely Otherwise, they'd run out of fuel and end up ditching in the water or get captured over Japan. So that's the basic history of it. The game itself recreates that. All right. Uh, there are multiple scenarios to the game. You can play parts of the game or you can play the entirety of it uh, planning to conclusion. These videos are going to uh, cover the entirety of the game, which is scenario 10 in the uh, scenario booklet. Uh, that way, no matter what scenario you're playing, the video itself will take and you can just watch whatever one works for you. I'm going to take and start with the planning phase and do kind of a talk through playthrough of it. I'll uh, tell you about each of those little phases, what they mean, how they interact with each other, and then make my decisions as we're going along and let you guys see how that kind of plays out. One more thing I wanted to add is that this is something that GMT did that I absolutely love. It is each of the phases there's a uh, player aid for, and this distills the rule book down to a single player aid, and you have your planning turn, naval turn, flight turn, attack turn, all right? The entirety of the game, whatever portion you're on, you grab that player aid, and you can pretty much walk through it and play the game. You won't have to keep referencing the rule book. Now, yes, you still have to read the rule booklet to understand what everything's talking about, but after you read it and have a general understanding of the rules, uh, you can take and use these. There are a couple other player aids uh, that reference a few things that happen in the game. We'll touch on those when we get to them. Now, I'm going to take and move the camera over to the planning phase, and we're going to go down each one of the months, January, February, March, and April, and just kind of play it out and talk through what's going on and let you guys see how that part works, okay? All right, guys, this here is the January turn, all right? This is where your game is going to start in its entirety. And the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to pick how many aircraft you're taking off with. You can have up to 24 of your B-25 bombers. You can see Doolittle's there on the top, which, by the way, the game comes with the little see if you guys can see that the thin white counters personally i don't mind them i kind of like them they have a neat little see if you, can, you know chip sound kind of like a a poker chip so i like the counters i know some people don't care for them but just to fyi so you know before you get the game uh the counters are nice though um anyway you pick how many aircraft you're going to take with you you can have up to 24 and the game simulates it uh, later on in the turns. You'll find out uh, when we get down, especially into the April phase, uh, how that affects it. But the way to think about it is the more planes you take, the more crew there is, the more pilots, the more people who are getting trained and moved around, the more likely it is that there's going to be a security risk and someone's going to blab. Uh, so there is a bonus for taking less aircraft. Me personally, I am choosing 18 because that's the most amount of aircraft I can take and still get an extra uh, security dice uh, at the end in April, which will carry on throughout you know, the game itself. 
Uh, I'll explain the security dice when we get down to the April section. Now, these three columns here, you've got your red, blue, and light blue. Those correlate to landing in Russia, landing in China, and rendezvousing with Nimitz. Now, the bottom uh, row here is Nimitz, and you're trying to convince him to do a joint ops with you to send the USS Enterprise to rendezvous with our task force. Obviously, we want this to happen. We need this to happen. It's one of the ones you have to put that there. You don't have a choice. Well, you have to put him somewhere on this is what I mean. You don't have to put him necessarily in February. I chose February because I want the best chance of having the Enterprise for the Naval section to help escort. I also chose to brief him, which is something you can do once per month and you can brief any of the people once and once per month you can use an urgent marker and each one of those is going to take and give you a plus one to your role. For example, when we get to the February month, I need a seven or better to get uh, Nimitz to take and agree to do the joint ops. But when I do roll on that, since he's briefed, it's six or better. And since Doolittle is here, which I'll explain in just a sec, it's gonna be a five or better. So my chances keep going up with every little thing that I add to him. The others pertain the exact same way as far as adding urgent and brief markers. I have put an urgent marker on, uh, what's his name, Stillwell. Uh, I also put him in the February column to reduce the amount of uh, uh, security risk. And your security risk is shown up here, this red number next to each one of the months. January plus four, February plus three, March plus two, and April plus zero. That is uh, simulating the earlier you're letting these people know, the more likely it is that someone's gonna blab the secret, it's gonna get out, the Japanese are gonna find out. So waiting to tell people helps to keep it secret, but waiting too long risks failure and you're not having a landing site and you're not having uh, help with the USS Enterprise. So I'm trying to kind of split my loss here. I'm not even using Thompson. I'm just using Stillwell. I'm just going for the landing in China and I am putting Nimitz as early as possible. Doolittle here, which uh, dropped him. He can be on one of two sides, okay? You can have Doolittle himself or he can be teleconferenced in, okay? Each one of the months, January, February, March, and April, have a bonus that they provide. For example, here he provides a plus one on your roll modifiers, which is great, but the modifiers he provides later on are even better. So you definitely want all of them. Me personally, I'm gonna use them as a telephone, which means I can use them in all four slots. If you use them as a person, he can only go in one of the months, January through, Mar uh, through April, but you don't get the telephone penalty when you get down to the April phase. So it is a trade-off, but I think the bonus that he provides is so powerful as a telephone, having him in all those slots versus the penalty that you get, which is just an elevated security risk. So it's definitely uh, useful to have him on the telephone side. In my opinion, you know, when you're playing the game, uh, absolutely make your own choices. So this is actually the end of the January phase from what I've done at this point, because no one's in the January boxes, so there's no one to roll on. Once this is actually succeeded, the Stillwell, that's when we start setting up uh, landing sites in uh, China. I'm not gonna pan the camera over there yet. I'll do that uh, later on in a following video, but just as an FYI, when you're doing that, you uh, during your diplomacy check, you'll set up a, if you succeed, you'll set up a landing site. You can stock it with fuel and crew, but it might get attacked by the Japanese or hit with a storm. Uh, like I said, we'll cover that uh, at the point when it gets to it. Now, let's check out February. Alright, this part here, this is my absolute favorite probably of the entire game. It's actually building the loadout for your B-25. 
And there are so many options for this thing. Uh, before I get started, let me point out right here at the bottom is your weight and modification track. Your weight is gonna start here at an eight. It says weight start on it. You got a little marker for it, marker for your guns and your modifications. And those are going to move just depending on what choices you make. The modifications marker on the back side of it, if you make a bunch, it goes up to plus six, and then you flip it over and you can start going again to keep track of how many mods uh, that you have made. Now, remember when I was mentioning about Doolittle and how awesome he is? You move his little telephone track down to remember that you get this bonus. There's a delay penalty for making modifications to the B25s. If you put Doolittle here or you um, have him on telephone, you get to waive that penalty and make modifications to your heart's content. Uh, but there are drawbacks that you have to keep track of. So for example, one of the things you can do is increase your fuel load. You start off with three fuel barrels, which are two fuel bar barrel, I'm choking on the word, two barrels per counter. So you have six fuel on each one of them. You can bump that up to eight fuel or you can bump that up to 10 fuel. And since it seems like everything takes fuel, I want to take and give myself some extra fuel to try to make sure that my planes don't crash. But that means I sacrifice ordnance. See, adding ordnance would add weight and it would do extra damage and get stuff when we got to Japan, but it's taking up that slot. It's the same way with everything else. By the way, you're gonna take and move your little mod marker here every time you take and uh, make a modification like that. And doing the 10 fuel is actually two modifications because the front side counts as one and then flipping it over counts as another one. Me personally, what I've decided to go with is an improved top turret. That T that's on the bottom right of it means that I have increased training so that's an excellent thing to have. And what else did I pick? I picked 50 caliber guns because I like guns. The fake tail guns because they also give me training points, which I very much want. And I think that was it, wasn't it, that I picked? Eventual turret improved. I think I might have picked that too. I don't remember. Uh, you can take and improve your Norden bomb site, or you can reduce it down to a, what is that thing, Mark Twain site. I decided to leave that. Didn't take carburetors, which is something you can do with your engine, and you can remove your radio to reduce weight. But that, I don't know. Yeah, I think we'll go ahead and do that too. So what are we at here? I think we're at six modifications now. That's two, three, four, five, six, yep. Yeah. We're up here at six, and we've bumped our guns up a little bit. I think we might take and, and call it at that point. You've got, uh, like I said, de-icers, carburetor, extra ordnance, armor plating. The way that I've come to think about armor plating is your plane starts with two health, and you can increase it to three or reduce it to one. All right? It, right now, if you take one damage, you put a damage marker on, you take another damage, the plane's destroyed. If you add armor, you can take two damage, so it'd be a damage marker and then severe damage. And if you remove armor, any damage destroys the plane. I like to just play it in the middle ground without having to add the extra weight to it. So we'll just take and leave it at that. And I think we're pretty well good. We'll, we'll stick her there. Like I said, you definitely want this bonus to not get hurt from all the modifications that you made because that can severely increase your security risk there at the end uh, by causing you a delay uh, when your planes are moving around the country and all that good stuff. So now this actually isn't the end of the February phase. Now remember, January, we selected February to make our checks. Okay, so let's pan back up there real quick. We have two checks to make. We have Stillwell, and we have a bonus of plus three because he's been briefed. We put an urgent marker on it, which 
If we wanted to, we could put another urgent marker on it now, but I'm not gonna do that because I don't wanna risk the penalty. And we have Nimitz and he's been briefed with no urgent marker and we get the plus one for Doolittle. So we're gonna take two of our little dice here. I'll back it out so you guys can see my janky little dice tray here. I'm gonna grab for this room and we'll do still wall first. Like I said, we've got a three modifier on it. So we need a six or better to get the uh, uh, get still well, which would be very good for us. All right, we got an eight. So we are gonna take and flip this marker over, which means still well has locked us in a landing site and we can take and put a landing beacon down on one of our um, landing sites in China and start stocking it with fuel and crew. Like I said, I'll show you that part in a later video when we're over at that section of the board. Now, had we failed, the person we're trying to convince, Chang, you would put his marker on the board and you would get a negative one modifier because he had denied us previously. We didn't have to worry about it at this point. However, you could also put him on the board and brief him. So he's another guy you can brief as well as Stalin, who you see here. You can brief Stalin as well to get a plus one modifier, but if you fail trying to get a Soviet landing site, he gives you a two modifier, negative modifier. So that is definitely something to keep in mind. Now, we've got our landing site locked in. Perfect, so we don't have to worry about that anymore. Now we roll on the Nimitz. We've got our plus one plus one for debrief, and the plus one is for uh, Doolittle. It's a seven or better to beat, so now we have to roll a five or better to take and uh, have Nimitz do it, but we will have another chance in March and April if we fail this, however, it gets harder. It's eight in March and nine in April, so we wanna hit this as early as possible. See what we get here. All right, we got it. We got ourselves another eight. So we are good to go. We've got the Nimitz locked in. We've got our plane set up. And now we go to March, which is the training phase for the most part. All right, you guys, hold on. All right, here's the uh, portion where you're gonna make your choices on certain types of training and where you're going to go to um, train your guys, what airfield you're gonna go to. Uh, all that type stuff, all right? Before we get into this, make sure you remember that if you have already locked in a landing field in China or multiple landing fields, that you are conducting your event checks. That's the only point I'm not showing that's uh, uh, part of the planning phase. Like I said, we will cover it at a later video, but make sure you're doing that after each month that you do have a landing field in China. All right, now, one of the first things you're gonna do Make sure that you're moving your do little marker if you do have him on telephone because he does increase your morale. Your morale track here gives you training points of which you could possibly have some extras if you made certain modifications to your B25s. It starts here at seven. Do little bumps it up one morale and you do have the ability to brief your crew about their mission by flipping over the marker which will increase another. However, I'm not gonna do that because the penalty for that is actually pretty severe. So we're not gonna take and brief our crews about what's going on. So do little bumps us one morale, and then we have this marker to take and pick which airfield we're gonna to go to. If we go to McClellan Airfield, we only get one secrecy die, but we get two extra training points. If we go to Eglin Airfield, we get two secrecy dies to keep. So I'm going to go to Eglin because I want those dice. Now I am going to flip this marker as well, which will bump our morale another point up. At this point, we have 10 training points and 12 possible uh, elite pilots to get. Elite pilots give you bonuses to your aircraft like uh, extra fuel, uh, bonus points for your pilot and target acquisition, things like that. Um, they're an all-around good thing to have, but we're not done yet, okay? We still have our security measures that we're going to implement. You can quarantine, put the FBI on alert, you know, keep everything as secret as possible. 
extra MPs for the base, and then the no wives clause. All of those will improve secrecy, but they crush morale. Quarantine is one that's a, a very easy pick because you get two dice and it doesn't hurt morale. So we'll take that one. We'll also take the FBI and get an extra dice and drop morale. And we'll take extra MPs to get one another dice and we'll drop morale one more time. I am not going to take and go the no wives clause because I just, I can't do that to my guys. They gotta have some wifey time. They might not be coming home. So once we're done with those decisions, we are left with seven training points. However, we did get two bonus ones from the uh, decisions we made when modifying our uh, B-25s and we have nine, it's a small little green number in the bottom left, elite pilots to take. You are allowed to pick or randomly choose your elite pilots. They look like this. They've got a little marker there. You can see Doolittle and Doolittle gives you a reroll that you can use. I went ahead and picked a bunch of pilots to use. You can see they have a bunch of different little bonuses that will come into play later into the game. So you can see here already the decisions that you're making are going to have such an impact later on. Uh, how many pilot, uh, how many elite uh, pilots you're going to have, what elite pilots you have, where they're going, all that just Oh, I love this stuff. All right, now let's pan down a little bit. This is also part of March, okay? Sorry about the little bit of light glare. I've got a plexiglass going on over this. Now, we're doing our training for bombing, night flying, navigation, short takeoff, hedge hopping, which is basically how elusive your planes are, and your gunnery. We know that I have nine total points to spend here. I would definitely suggest spending two points in short takeoff. You've got to spend at least one to uh, see where you're going to rank on this. For one point, you can roll two dice, and depending on where this lands on your two dice roll, the number to the right shows you how many uh, B-25s you can fit on your carrier deck. And you see Ds and Cs here on the chart. C means it was crashed, the B-25 was crashed, and D means damaged, okay? So for each one of those letters, you have to damage and or destroy one of your um, planes. Now before we do this, you can spend an extra training point to take and roll a third die, but the third die is not spent until after you roll your first two. So whatever you get first, you take and apply those effects. Then you can take and roll a third die and wherever it lands, you have to apply those effects as well. So if you land here, you roll low, unfortunately, and then roll low again, you're damaging a mess load of planes. That's just the risk you take as far as training is concerned. Now, before we can address the rest of these, all of them have the ability to be flipped over as extra training. Extra training will move you one point up whatever track that you're on and it grants you an elite pilot, but extra training does increase your risk of delay and secrecy and all that good stuff getting messed up. So it's just like everything else in this game, it's a trade off on what you're gonna do. Now what I've decided to do is to take each one of these little T's is how many points you have to spend, okay? So it's not like one, two, three points, it's one point, then another two points to get up on your bombing skill to plus two. So that would be three points spent total. I know I'm gonna spend two here. I'm gonna spend one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. No wait, because I know I need two there and <clears throat> I only have nine. So I have seven points to spend. I had this mapped out in my head. Let's figure out where are we gonna go. I know I want to bump each one of them up at least one. I'm not worrying about gunnery because I've already got a fairly decent gunnery skill with the improved top turret and 50 caliber, 50 caliber guns. So I'm not going to spend points there. That's four points, six points. Hmm. Oh, that's what it was. I'm going to do elite training on one and spend the remaining points there. So I'm going to get one extra. Uh, elite pilot and I'm gonna have to pay for that extra training and possible delays later the remaining two points 
are going to be spent here. First point will be a roll for uh, to see where we land on this track and then I want to ensure that I'm high on this track as much as possible so I'm going ahead and paying for that third die. So let's take our little dice here we'll pan it out just a little bit. Again sorry about the glare but I've got this under plexiglass. Let's take and roll. Oh look at this I got a 10 right off the bat so that bumps me up to right there that's nice that gives me only one damage marker as you can see there's a d there in that slot so i'll take a damage marker which will be put on one of my b25s i went ahead and paid for it so i've got one extra die to roll as long as i roll a two or higher i get maxed out so i can have all my planes on the deck but even a one will get me 18 planes so i'm good there and drop it in here and what you look at this hopefully it stays this way so i am maxed out i can have all my planes and honestly this that came out very well for me <laughs> april's probably going to go to hell so i've got the carrier deck to hold 20 planes and i'm maxed out there i've got a plus one in my evasion no extra uh gunnery ability but i'm decent as it is, I've got uh, four dice to throw, so I'm good there. Uh, plus one on my bombing, plus two on both night and uh, day navigation, because depending on when you attack, it could be night or day, so you have to be prepared for both. That covers March. Again, at this point, we will be doing an event check for any of our uh, landing fields. I'll do that quickly off camera, and we're gonna cover um, April here. All right, we're on our last portion of April here. And unfortunately, in the process of uploading this video to my computer, it ate this portion of the video. So I'm going to talk you through what I did since I've already played through this portion of it. Uh, and to be quite honest about it, I got some excellent rolls here. And I really didn't want to screw up my game because I'm doing so good at this point. And I've got a chance of bombing Japan uh, really well. I don't want to mess it up. So I'm going to talk, <clears throat> talk you through what happened and explain how this works because april is pretty much handled by this chart okay uh there's a couple of charts here tables on the uh, the map itself but the majority of it really comes down to the player aid itself the first thing that you're going to do is plan your rv uh, your rendezvous and your launch plan all right that's where you're planning to rendezvous up with the uss enterprise where you're planning on to uh, planning to launch your B-25s at and what turn you're planning all this to happen. That's going to be harder for people who are newer to the game. What I did was went back and looked at some of the previous scenarios to see where those scenarios put the markers because in scenario 10 where we're making all these decisions it's up to us but in the previous scenarios they tell you. That's a, a good starting point to go with. Um, I will cover the specifics of those when I do the naval video itself, but the basic gist is you want to put them in a spot that is the most advantageous for you. Uh, for example, I put my rendezvous, rendezvous point here at Midway because that's one of the lowest numbers to actually get the rendezvous and you don't want to uh, have that fail. Now when you do your transit check this is when you're moving your aircraft from wherever you trained at to the coast to be loaded onto the uh, the aircraft the aircraft carrier down here in the bottom it gives you your transit <clears throat> checks and there are modifiers you get a plus one for do little plus three if you trained at mcclellan that's the one that has only one dice and two training points so i didn't get that bonus <clears throat> and you subtract any extra training you did. Since I had uh, one extra training done, that cost me a negative one modifier. Again, Doolittle's on his telephone side, so bonus for him and every month. So basically I got a plus one, minus one there. I ended up getting two transit hazards, which came out to just one damage onto one of my aircraft. So it wasn't as bad as it could have been. Um, after you do that, you do your crane check okay and this is when you're loading your aircraft onto the uh, 
aircraft carrier, but you have to pick a diligence number. And I was trying to think of a good way to explain this. The higher the number you pick here, it helps, but if you pick too high here, it can crush you in your delay check, okay? So you can pick any number. You can pick 100, you can pick 1,000 if you want. But whatever diligence number you pick here as a bonus for yourself when you're loading your aircraft becomes a negative modifier when you have your delay check. So honestly, I usually pick zero as my uh, diligence modifier because uh, I'll explain it in the de uh, delay check, but generally I don't need it when I uh, get to this point. Uh, I ended up rolling a 10. I got lucky on that one. <laughs> that was one of the things I was talking about. I didn't want to go back and have to redo it and get some low rolls, which actually was nothing. So I got no damage, no transit hazard, and no security risk added. So that was perfect. I couldn't have done any better there. They uh, go to your last de uh, diplomacy check. Oh, before I forget to mention, any aircraft that have been damaged at this point, you can repair. So if you damage them, load them on, if they were damaged in training, uh, things of that nature, uh, you can repair them. Uh, I ended up having a couple that were damaged that I did repair, and you have to keep that in mind because it is a negative modifier. And like I was saying, this is your last chance for your diplomacy checks, which is if you haven't found a landing site or gotten Nimitz uh, locked on to rendezvous with you yet, absolutely put everything you have into that. Put your urgent markers down. Brief them if you haven't at the, uh, this point. You have to get those done at all costs at this point. Uh, also remember that if you already have landing fields set up, you got to do your um, event checks on those as well. All right. Now we get to our delay check, okay? And this is what you really don't want to have happen. You do not want your task force to get delayed because that will crush you. Now, when you look at the delay check, there's a little chart right here at the bottom of the aircraft carrier. You only have to beat a two. A three or higher means no delay, but that diligence number that you picked down here becomes, like I said, the negative modifier up here. So you don't want to pick a high number because it will crush you. Also, any modifications that you made when you were loading up your aircraft, when you were picking what it's going to be outfitted with, are also a negative modifier, plus any repairs that you made. So when I made mods, I had six mods on mine. So that's a negative six. I made two repairs, which was uh, also added to that. So that's a negative eight right there. That's, that's a mess of plus whatever if I had picked a diligence number. However, since I had Doolittle, um, since I had his telephone, but effectively I got his bonus for February, that means I don't have to worry about the modification delay. So that's a big reason that I suggest having him on his telephone is because his bonuses are so powerful uh, all throughout. Uh, didn't have to worry about that, so I ended up having a negative two, and then if you brief Nimitz, you get a plus five. So I ended up with an ultimate of a plus three modifier. Since you only need a three to not get a delay, my task force wasn't delayed automatically, so that's outstanding. Now, after you do that is when you get into your security check. This is the big reason I was talking about needing those dice, okay? Your dice get added up. It tells you here, you know, how to add everything up. Ultimately, I ended up with seven security dice. The max that you can have is eight. <clears throat> I got two for quarantine, one for FBI, one for um, MPs, two for the landing field, and then another for um, having 18 or fewer B-25s. Seven dice is outstanding. You definitely wanna have at least, I would say five, six, preferably. The fewer of those that you have, the harder it's going to be on you to maintain secrecy as you go along. And I'll explain that here in just a sec. <clears throat> Here's where you assess your security risk. So the earlier you brief your diplomats, if you briefed them in January, they add four to your security risk. Three for February, two for March, you know, and so on. So I had a plus three for that. Uh, plus one for each marker on the calendar. I had one briefing and two, what? Yeah, two urgent markers. So that got me a plus three. So I was up to plus 10. 
right here you can see that if the squadron is, was briefed, that's a plus four. So that's a big reason I suggest not briefing the squadron unless you absolutely need that morale. And then you get a plus one for each extra training. I ended up coming out to a plus 10 there, which isn't horrible. And then these are all variable, okay? If your task force was delayed, extra security risk. If the Japanese attacked your landing sites, extra security risk. If you granted your squadron liberty, security risk. And if Doolittle used the phone, security risk. Ultimately, my security risk ended up coming out to a 14. I'll zoom in on that real quick. So this is the track that's going to be on your board and this is going to affect you the rest of the game. There are a couple of markers. You got one that just says security risk and then you have another that says plus 10. So you can keep track of exactly how much your security risk is. Mine is at a 14 now currently and your secrecy value is how many dice that you have to throw. Come on, zoom in that way. I have seven, like I said, is outstanding. I did my security check and passed, and to do your check, your security check, whenever you're uh, addressed to do one, you roll whatever your secrecy value is, and it has to beat your security risk. At this point in the game, it doesn't do anything except for add a failure if you do fail. I ended up passing it because I got a lot of dice and my security risk is rather low at this point. But that's going to go up. It goes up by one each time you um, uh, have to do a check automatically and then it can be raised through other things which you guys will see in the naval flight and attack segments of the game. But at this point we are done with our planning phase. We're getting ready to go into the naval phase where our task force will be moving across the ocean, trying to meet up again with the Enterprise and then get our planes launched off. There's possibilities of boat attacks, there's possibilities of air attack. Um, if the Hornet gets damaged, you can have your mission end early right now and the task force be forced to turn around. And the neat part about this is that depending on where you launch in the ocean, depends on where you're gonna start in your flight phase and just I love how everything ties together it was like I was saying at the beginning of the video the smallest choice that you make in the beginning of the game the choice to brief that diplomat or to mark something as urgent could possibly affect you later on in the game and you could end up causing the uh, Japanese to go ahead and attack you and come after your guys and they take out your aircraft carrier or you Luck out, you know, you get what I'm saying. Everything ties into each other. And that's why I was saying this game is so much like Warfighter and other games of its ilk that the funnest part, especially like a lot of the DVG games, the leader games, where so much of the fun of those games is the start of it. I love this right side of the board. This is my absolute favorite part of the game. I almost just want to take him keep playing that out just to see what I can come up with, especially outfitting the uh, the B-25s. I love that part of the game. I think it's an excellent choice. But anyway, uh, after this, we're going to take, like I said, get into the uh, naval phase. We're going to see how that goes. Then we'll do the flight phase and then the attack phase. And at that point, uh, I don't know how to pronounce the word, denouement, denouement, whatever it is. Uh, the cleanup phase the end of the game where you find out how well you've done after you've made your raid on Tokyo. Anyway, you guys be looking out for that and I'll see you guys in the next video.